So I want to, um, or maybe when you finish grad school, or come to grad, when you go to grad school, you'll, you'll demand that Fermilab get involved in, in a project to explore the cosmic microwave background. So I've mentioned this a few times, and so why, why am I so excited about it? Remember, this is a picture of what the universe looked like when it was 400,000 years old. So it's a cosmologist's dream. It's really a picture of a very young universe. And so it behooves us to ask the question of what we can learn from this, um, from this cosmic microwave background. And this is going to be a little bit technical. So, you know, if you haven't fallen asleep now, now's a good chance to, uh, to, uh, to uh, do that option number three. But if, if you're willing to stay with me, the, the payoff is good because the, the physics we can learn from these little hot spots and cold spots is really enormous. And we've already learned quite a bit, and, and I hope to try to convey that to you in the, if I could just stop giving an introduction. Okay, so let me go with it. Um, all right, so the, this, this is the way you should think of this. We're sitting here on Earth, and we're seeing the universe, what, what it looked like when, when it was 400,000 years old, right? Now, photons that were emitted right around from here, 400, when the universe was 400,000 years old, have long passed us, right? And photons that were emitted from here haven't reached us yet, right? Because light takes the same, same amount of time to travel. So it's only really the photons from here that we see. So really, we're not seeing a 3D picture of the universe. We're seeing really a spherical shell of what the universe looked like. So that's one thing to keep in mind. What was going on at that time? And so at that time, remember I told you that before, after that time, the photons decoupled from the electrons and the, pro and the protons, and they just went on their merry way, freely traveled. But before then, they were tightly coupled. They were strongly interacting with uh, electrons and protons. So it was all one big fluid, or plasma. So what was going on with that plasma? And I'd like to argue that there were acoustic oscillations going on. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about it, let's say there's an overdense region of radiation and, and matter, the electrons and protons. There's, there's one spot that has more of that stuff than a nearby spot. Well, because photons and can move very rapidly, and they can drag the electrons with them, that overdense stuff, the excess photons, will just move out of it. Right? The pressure of the photons will act against you know, uh, an acceleration of more and more stuff coming in. So an overdense region will quickly become underdense. And similarly, an underdense region will quickly become overdense. So what you have is you have two opposing forces. So you have pressure, which acts to reduce the density, and that the pressure acts as a restoring force. So the shorthand way I think of it is as gentrification, right? If you have a neighborhood which is really, really, really nice, then it gets saturated with Starbucks, and then people start moving out, and then it becomes really <laughs> grungy, and then the Starbucks move in again. So it's a constant wave setup, right? You have the constant thing going back and forth. Of course, there's a much better example, and that is the string on a string instrument, right? There's a restoring force. If you pluck a guitar string, it gets the restoring force pulling it back to the center. And that's precisely the physics that was operating on the hot and on the on the radiation that in the early universe. So let's explore this in, in quite a bit of detail, uh, uh, the physics of the guitar string. In order to do that, I want to work in Fourier space. So I want, I want to be very clear about what, um, what, what, I'm, what I'm doing. So you know that the motion of any string can be decomposed into Fourier modes. So here's an example. Here, here is the motion of a string. So it, look, the, it looks like this, right? And this is the sum of two different Fourier modes, one with a large wavelength and one with the small wavelength, right? You can clearly see that this is this, this is this is this large scale mode with small scale oscillations on it, right? What is the spectrum of this um, of this amplitude? What does the spectrum of that look like? The spectrum just plots the amplitude of the Fourier modes. Well, the spectrum is just going to be a low frequency piece and a, or a long wavelength piece and a short wavelength piece, right? right? So this does everyone does everyone see something like this that the that uh, if you have a uh, Fourier mode, you can plot the spectrum of something. So you can, and this spectrum in this case, where I've just had two um, modes, is just the, you know two peaks. So the same thing holds in our universe at large as well. If we're taking a plot in the density in the universe, we can decompose it into <coughs> Fourier modes. So you can imagine adding this Fourier mode with this Fourier mode. Here I've only done it in 2D, so you have to use your imagination to do 3D, but this is two-dimensional, right? And you get something which looks a little more complicated, right? And then you can imagine adding a third Fourier mode, which looks like this, get something which is beginning to look like a realistic universe, right? So you can go backwards then and decompose the observed universe into Fourier modes. What would be the spectrum of this, of this, um, of this, uh, this real, this, uh, what do I call it? 
this? What would be the spectrum of this? What would be the spectrum of this? This is the sum of three different Fourier modes. What would be the spectrum of this? Well, it's not three different modes, right? But notice I was pretty careful. I chose the wavelength of each of these modes to be the same, just oriented differently, right? So, and you can do that because in two dimensions or three dimensions, you can have the same wavelength, just oriented in different ways. So the spectrum actually just looks like this. It's just a single, it's just a power at a single frequency, right? So that's just to keep in mind. So this is a complicated thing, so I want to walk through step by step. And more generally, of course, this is a very simple example. More generally, at every single wavelength of frequency, what you need to do is average all the modes in every single direction of 3D. And there are an infinite number of directions with the same wavelength, right? So keep that in mind. OK. So now let's take a, a worked example. So let's listen to a note on a simple stringed instrument. Good, so that's a simple stringed instrument. Now let's analyze the spectrum of that note. Okay, so that's the note. And we can analyze the spectrum of that. It looks like this. So this is not surprising to you, I don't think, right? Because most of you know a lot more about music than I do, and you, you've probably learned about this recently. So there's a peak in the spectrum. Why is the peak at 256 hertz? It's a Sina, right? That's the definition, I think, of the Sina, right? And then there's a second peak at 512 hertz. Why is the second peak at 512 hertz? It's the first harmonic, right, of the, of the fundamental. And in fact, there are harmonics at every single multiple of the fundamental frequency. The fundamental frequency is 256. There's one at twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. And so you see clearly there's a, there's a very simple, this is due to the restoring force, right? You have the simple uh, progression of the simple spectrum, which has the peaks at the multiples of the fundamental frequency. Question about that? Okay. So now I want to show you that was a spectrum of a musical instrument, and it was a pretty simple one. Right? It was a simple ukulele, and it was a pretty simple note. It was a C string, right? And that's what it looked like. Now I'm going to show you the spectrum of the universe. So before I show it to you, I, first of all, keep that in your mind what you just saw, and then I want to tell you exactly what I'm what I'm showing you. This is that map of the cosmic microwave background. So it looks at the temperature in every single direction on the sky. And then it takes attention to the Fourier transform of those directions. And it plots the spectrum. This is the map of the spectrum of the universe. So it's got a, a peak at a fundamental frequency. It's got a first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic. It's got the same exact structure of peaks and troughs that are observed in a simple, very simple musical instrument. That is quite remarkable, and it convinces me, at least, that the physics governing this stuff is identical to the physics governing the, the musical instrument. That's the note. Sorry, what's the what? The note. The note. That's a good question. So, so let's think about, um, you know, I think it's clear that the shape of those are, are different, are, are, are very similar, but there are some differences. So, for example, the frequency is... Um, well, first of all, let me say this it was one technical difference. In the musical, in the musical note, it was a Fourier transform of a temporal uh, oscillations, right? The time thing, we average over time. And uh, in the micro background, it's a spatial thing. That turned out to be completely relevant. That's just a mathematical level. That's relevant. And then there's, there's something which you mentioned that the time scale is a little bit longer. The, the fundamental note of the, uh, of the ukulele was 1 260th of a second. And the fundamental uh, time scale here is 400,000 years. That's really just a technical problem, right? So basically, <laughs> apart from these two things, it's the same exact physics. But there's a third thing that should be very disturbing to you. Because you've just learned about this musical instrument. Why is it? Why do you get that the only why do you only get um, peaks at those at those frequencies? N equal one, two, three, four. Why do you get that? On a guitar string. Come on, you just learned this, I'm sure. Within the last year. You solved this problem. Right, so um, so the thing is that the string is tied down at the ends, right? 
So the only allowed, remember that? that you, you had sine and cosine, and then you said, oh, it's tied down at the end, so the boundary condition is supposed to be sine. And then you said, oh, it's got to be sine and pi, x over L, whatever. So the, those are the only, fre only frequencies that are allowed are the ones that are dictated by the fact that it's tied down. The, um, the universe is not tied down, though. <laughs> Right? So this should be very disturbing to you that we see the same exact thing. The only reason why you saw the, 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 those frequencies on the ukulele is because the universe was tied down. The, the string was tied down in the fence. The universe is not tied down, so uh, all frequencies, you should get all frequencies. So now we're going to get really technical. I'm going to try to explain why it is that you get this series of peaks and troughs in the, in the cosmic microwave background <coughs> that you also see in the guitar string. And to look at this, what I'm plotting is the same clumpiness thing as a function of time, and time here ends, or each little one, at that time when the universe is 400,000 years old, that's when you know, all the oscillations stop and the photons just travel freely on their way. So a very large wavelength from a Fourier mode basically does nothing. And the reason for that is because the wavelength is so large that physics can operate you know, affect such a large scale mode. There's just not enough time for anything to happen to affect such a large scale mode. If you look at a slightly smaller scale mode, it begins its oscillations, and by the time it gets stuck right over here, this is where we see it, right? We see it when it's, when it's right over there. That when, at the time that we actually observe it, it happens to be at a maximum of its oscillation. If you look at the first trough, though, that's a smaller scale mode. That's begun to oscillate earlier. So this is, I know, pick your political metaphor. This is uh, John McCain mode. It peaked too early, right? And its amplitude at, um, at, the, at the time of 400,000 years old is zero. So we don't see that at all. And similarly, the, the second peak mode will have undergone just enough so we pick it up at its maximum amplitude at the time of 400,000 years old. So it's not that those frequencies don't exist in cosmology. They all exist. But we only see certain ones of them because we're only picking, looking at the universe at a specific time, right? Only those photons that are on that surface of last scatter. So there are only certain modes we, we see. And, uh, and that, th those correspond to the peaks. And the ones we don't see correspond to the trunk. Okay, there's a final puzzle that I'll get to left, get out of here in five minutes. And the, the question is, why are all those modes in phase? Remember, what we needed to do is we needed to average up over many different 4A modes. Every single one of those frequencies, we're averaging over many different modes with many different directions, right? And what I implicitly assumed in this, in this uh, little cartoon diagram is that every single one of them, one of those modes, were in phase. So. What I'm assuming for the first peak is I only drew one of these curves that reached the maximum at the final time. But what I should have drawn was an infinite number of modes, because we average, have to average over an infinite number, of, infinite number of directions, right? And those infinite number of directions have to all be in exact, have exactly the same phase, all coming in with essentially zero velocity. And similarly, with the first peak, the first trough mode, they all had to come in. All these infinite number of modes had to come in so that they actually all have zero amplitude at the time we see them. Really, what, sh what I should have done is not assume that at all. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no physical mechanism that expects us to be able to, um, to understand how all of these different modes got to be in phase with one another. So if they were not in phase, if they all started out with random phases, what we should see is not a first peak or a first trough, but just mush. So the fact that we see this coherent picture of peaks and troughs just on the ukulele tells us that at the onset, when these perturbations were first produced, that they were set. They were set in motion together with the same phase. I'm running out of time, so I just want to skip to the punchline, which is that um, what had to have happened is that very early in the history of the universe, the universe went underwent a period of accelerated expansion, which we call inflation. And it was at the, so. This corresponds to the distance between two things. This is the distance traveled by light. For most of the history of the universe. None of these four modes could evolve at all because the distance, the wavelength was larger than the distance traveled by light. So what had happened is these initial perturbations were set down very early, the first fraction of a second, during this epoch of inflation. So look at this picture for a second and uh, notice that what's happening here is the universe is expanding extremely rapidly or accelerating. And what that means is that um, to get inflation and to get these synchronized peaks and troughs in the microwave background, what had to have happened is you had some early epoch of dark energy. So you might have heard about dark energy, the current dark energy. There is evidence actually from the microwave background that there was an early epoch of dark energy. This is much different. It's got a much different energy scale, and it happened at a much different time. But one thing is similar. 
And that is neither has any connection to anything in the standard model. So these pictures of the microwave background convince us that there is indeed another piece of physics beyond the standard model. And there are ways of testing this theory of inflation. And the best way is to look for what are called gravity waves that are produced during inflation. And there are a number of experiments now which are geared up to detect these gravity waves by looking at the polarization pattern, patterns. Unfortunately, we affirm that we're not yet involved in one of those experiments, but I hope we will get involved in one over the next decade. So to conclude, the standard model, model has really taught us how to do cosmology. I haven't focused on that at all, because that's something you would have heard 10 years ago. Rather, what I've been focusing on is that by looking at observations from space, we have um, obtained the only evidence for physics beyond the standard model, and that's really helped us chart the course for future and, and current experiments. There are lots of mysteries which remain to be solved, including the mass hierarchy, dark matter, and dark energy. And basically, it's your job, right? You are the people responsible to solve these problems. So my first piece of advice to you is to get going and buy this book. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh. <laughs>